sure that as we get started um, in the in the realm of um, hoarding and decluttering and what have you, that we understand that this can apply to anybody, right? This doesn't mean that you're ill. This doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. This doesn't mean that you have a mental illness of some sort. This means there may be markers. That's all this means. Now, there might be someone that you know in your own personal life that you think is a hoarder or you think they're a super big clutter bug, or maybe they have some kind of issues or problems or something of that sort, and you're wanting to help them. But how do you know how to help them if you don't know what the issues are? Right. So that's why we're going to have this conversation today. And I'm really excited about it because I've spent a lot of time over the last 31 years as I've worked with families trying to figure out why do some people become hoarders when they weren't in the beginning. And then other people always seem to have had a lot of stuff. Right. It seems like there are lots of different variations of what we call hoarding. And so one of the things that's interesting to me is that there are triggers a lot of times that will take a person that has a normal everyday life and they have no symptoms of hoarding and they have no hoarding tendencies and suddenly something will trigger that. And in order to, I don't know, pacify a feeling or a series of feelings, they start collecting things and hanging on to things for dear life and they don't let them go. And then suddenly it's kind of like their life pivots and they have other stuff going on in their life that, that now we have to declutter and, and remove from their life, right? So today I want to take a look at what is it that causes those markers that make us go, whoa, wait a second. Not that anything is wrong, but maybe I should pay more attention. As my doctor was telling me, this doesn't mean anything is wrong. We're doing a series of tests just to make sure that nothing is wrong, right? Because once you are aware, you have choices, right? Okay, I wanna start and I wanna go back a very long ways to the lifestyle that I grew up with. And I come from a family that had hoarding tendencies. They're not hoarders, but they had hoarding tendencies. And this is my mother and her, she's from a large family and her mother had lots of stuff. Imagine having 16 kids. This is my grandmother. You would have a lot of stuff, right? Then my mother turned around and had 19 kids of her own. Again, a lot of stuff. So having a lot of stuff in the house was not unusual. And it was always highly organized in both of their homes. But as a tiny child, I watched my grandmother and every time I went to her house, she was moving box to box to box to box, just moving stuff around to make room for us to come play. And I thought how sad to have this much stuff. And I mean, it, it was stuff that they used, right? It wasn't that it was an excess of stuff. It was just a tiny house with lots of stuff. Then as I watched my own mother, and my own mother was good. Oh, she was good. She gave us each a milk crate. And she said, put all your stuff in this milk crate. <laughs> Anything that fits in there, you get to keep. Anything that doesn't, it's either part of the family household stuff or we need to get rid of it. So she was always helping us cut down stuff so that we didn't have too much stuff. But when I moved out on my own, and here's the trigger for me. When I moved out on my own, I was like, whoa, look at me now. I don't have to keep all my stuff in a milk case. And I had gone through several generations of hand-me-downs. By the time I got dressed just as a kid, I was on the sixth or seventh generation of a pair of clothing. Nothing was ever new and nothing was ever mine. And so the very first time I went out on my own, the very first thing I did is I started shopping. And I was like, oh, look at me now. I can buy shoes that are only mine. I don't have to share them with anybody. I can buy clothes that are only for me. I don't have to share them with anybody. And no one else has worn these except me. And then I found discount clothes. And oh, my goodness, I could save money. And I started, and it was a trigger for me. I, it was a new sense of freedom. It was not that anything bad had happened in my life. Everything good had happened in my life. But for the first time, I found my, myself in a state of, well, look at me now. I can buy whatever I want. And I did. And I really enjoyed it. And it was awesome. And I didn't know where to stop. I just kept buying more and more and more of it. But in the back of my mind, my unconscious mind was environmental, right? Because what I had always seen is lots of loads of laundry every day. And we hung up the clothes on the line so that they would dry outside on the line. But I saw lots of clothes. That was my norm. That was my environment. And so going out on my own to only have a few clothes, that wasn't my norm. That wasn't my comfort zone. So I went out of my way unconsciously to recreate that so I would be back in my comfort zone. I know what to do with lots of loads of laundry and lots of clothes that need to be processed on a daily basis. And it wasn't healthy, but those were my markers. That's where I was coming from, right? Now, I live in a, a metropolitan city and there are stores everywhere. I can go shopping everywhere. Like there, there's just stores everywhere. And so there's no need today 
for me to keep hanging on to lots of stuff. Because if I need something at the store, the store is literally like two minutes away. Okay. I can just hop in my car and buzz over to the store and go get what I need and come back and I'm, I'm good to go. My parents do not live in that kind of an environment. Okay. They live 50 miles outside of a normal town that would have stores that I can drive to in four or five minutes. And so their situation is different because when they go to town, they want to get everything that they need so they don't have to make trips back and forth 50 miles each way. Right. So there are reasons why people live the way they do. And this a conversation is not to judge anyone as much as it is to make us aware, right? So this is that awareness conversation. And uh, I, I do want to stop here for a second and say hi to everybody that's joined us. We've got Patty G here. We've got Melanie. Hi, you guys. It's so super to see you. Thank you for joining me here today. And uh, one of the things that I want to share with you is that while I was growing up, we had lots and lots and lots of plans. I mean, lots of plans. And so a scene like this was my norm. This is what I grew up with seeing. And this is um, uh, store-bought plants that have been removed out of the plant holders and they've been planted in the ground. And then there are these plastic, they're cheap plastic, but plastic pots that have ventilation at the bottom. So if you were to reuse them again, or you were, to, you were to create a smaller plant from a larger plant, you were to do some grafting and put it inside, you would have some extra pots to do that. Now, my family are avid gardeners, okay? We grew up on a farm. We've always, always had lots and lots and lots of plants. And to this day, my dad is an avid gardener. My sisters, my mother, they're, every day they're out there watering and they're doing all these amazing things with plants. And when you walk into their yard, it looks like a botanical garden. It is just gorgeous. And you just take pictures everywhere you go because it's so amazing. And somewhere along the backside of their property, they have a little stretch that's probably very similar to this picture where they have a whole lot of empty pots that could then be repurposed and used at a later date. Okay. No judgments there, but here are the markers. I live in a major metropolitan city and I do not live on a farm. I live in a, a house that has about an acre of property and we have at one time purchased a whole bunch of plants and we've manicured our acre of property. Okay. But we've been here for 13 years. I'm not potting and repotting plants like my parents are. I just have my plants in the ground. But I found myself one day with a whole bunch of pots just like this at my house. And I had to ask myself the question, what am I saving those pots for? Now, to be truthful, every once in a while, a plant dies and my husband will put it back inside the pot and he takes it back to the store because the roots were bad when they purchased the plant, but that's very rare and far between maybe four or five of those little buckets would suffice. I don't need hundreds of those buckets, right? You might have hoarding tendencies if you have hundreds of buckets of uh, empty pot plants like this that you're saving for, I don't know what. Are you an avid gardener and do you repot plants on a regular basis? If you are a gardener or a farmer and this is your norm, that's perfectly okay for you, right? But if that's not your norm and you're like me and you live in the city and you don't, you don't transfer plants on a regular basis, there's no reason to hang on to these over and over and over again. And I had not quite as many as are in this picture, but I had a lot. I'm going to say probably over 100. And so what I did one day is I boxed them up. I put them all in the back of my car. And there's a great big place that's probably about five miles from my house. And it's called the Grower's Outlet. And I went down to the Grower's Outlet and I said, hey, listen, you guys have plants that you use on a regular basis. Do you want all these pots? And they said, sure, just put them right over there. We'll take them and we'll recycle them and we'll use them as we graft plants and plant new stuff. So I was able to get rid of that, but get it out of my life because what I noticed for myself was I wasn't hanging on to them because I wanted them. And I wasn't hanging on to them because I was emotionally attached to them. And I wasn't hanging on to them for any sentimental reasons. I was hanging on to them because that was my norm. You see, that's where this gets interesting, right? We come from an environmental place of we just repeat what we know. We don't ask questions. We just repeat what we know. Then we wake up one day and we're like, whoa, wait a second. I have a choice. I can do something different than I've done in the past. And Joanne just, just joined us. And she said, uh, Joanne from Virginia here, completely relate as I earned my first significant paycheck now I still appreciate hand-me-downs, but being able to buy new clothes and purses, oh, the joy. Um, yeah, so I found myself in that same trap. There I was buying all kinds of stuff that I didn't need. Uh, hi, A-Rashi, good to see you guys. I'm so excited that you guys have joined me. This is just super cool. 
But the conversation that we're having is, do we need, do we need the stuff that we have and are we using it or are we keeping it because that's all we know, right? All right, this is an old beat up junk car. And I know none of you have an old beat up junk car somewhere on your property, but I wanna share this with you. If you grow up on a farm, it is very easy to see as you drive through the fields and you drive past farms that people have old beat up cars or cars that have rusted to pieces or cars that have fallen apart and there wasn't either money to fix them or the parts were unavailable or it was an old car to begin with and now it's just even an older car maybe it was only purchased as a beater car. And so one day we're going to get around to hauling it off, right? Or it might be that you live so far out in the country that to haul it off would cost hundreds of dollars. And so people don't. And then they end up having one car and then one car becomes two cars, three cars after a 10 year, 15 year window, you got four or five old beat up rusty cars that are outside your property, right? I know none of us have vehicles that have expired or worn out or have been crashed or whatever that are sitting on our properties, right? It's possible. I was guilty one time of having a car, the engine blew. I was in my uh, early twenties. I didn't have the money to get it fixed. And a buddy of mine said, let me take that away from you and I will store your car until you can afford to get it fixed. And I said, okay. And I still owed about $6,000 on the car. And I, he took the car and he sold it for parts and didn't tell me. And I was still making the payments on it until I could save up enough money to get the car fixed. When I went to him and I said, hey, look, I've got the, I've got the money to get the car fixed. He said, oh, that car's been gone for a very long time. I sold it for the metal. And he said, uh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were never going to come for it again. And I had ended up paying off that entire $6,000 because I owed the money on it and I didn't want to default on the loan and I didn't want it to show up as a repo. So even though I didn't have access to it and I wasn't driving the car, I paid off every last cent and then there was no car at the end. <laughs> the good news is this, I did not end up with it on my property, right? So if you have an old beat up car that's on your property, it doesn't mean you're a hoarder, but it could be symptoms of hoarding tendencies, okay? Again, it's environmental. I just want us to be aware. So then we have choices. All right. The next one, this is kind of fun. Tires. This is not an old beat up car, but how many times have you had a flat tire and you go to get the tire fixed and they say, oh, well, this is a special kind of tire. We can't just replace one tire. We have to replace all four. And you say only one is bad. And so they take them all off so that they'll wear evenly and they give you the other three tires back. Okay, so the question is, do you save all three of those tires or do you only save one? Well, most people will say, well, I'll just save all three, right? And I have been guilty as long as I've lived, I mean, like until maybe two years ago with an extra set of tires, like three tires at every place I've ever lived because I rotated the tires and then I ended up with the extra tires, right? I do have hoarding tendencies, but for me, the, the reality was I kept saying to myself, well, I don't want to find myself with a flat tire and then I've got a spare that I could just put on it and then I, I don't have to buy four more again, right? And all the years, and I'm talking, you know, however many years that I've been on my own, um, I've only ever once used one of those tires. And I went on and they, they put it on for a weekend until they could order the new tire that actually needed to be put on my car. So I used an old tire one time, just as kind of like a Band-Aid approach until I got to a better tire. So you don't need all four, you need maybe one. And if you can make it into a planter or something, or you can hang on to it, hide it or something so that it's not right there on your property, great, right? But if you're storing a set or lots of sets of tires, you might have hoarding tendencies. All right. I, I love this conversation. It's making us look differently at things we have, right? All right. This is a set of old paint. And if you look at the bottom of this picture, I don't know what's inside these jugs and you probably don't either, but you might have something like this in your garage and maybe your parents did, or maybe your grandparents did. I know that as long as I've been alive, either my parents or my grandparents have had a stash like this. Now, what's really peculiar about this, and as I've gone through the cleaning industry, I've become much more conscientious of what is inside the bottle without a label because I would never use it again because I don't know what's inside right? I'm seeing lots of cans here. And although there are labels on the paint cans, whatever's in those jars there at the bottom, I do not know what's inside those jars. I do not know how old is what is inside those jars. And so if you know what's in there today and you say, oh, well, I will remember, 
Are you going to remember two years from now? Are you going to remember five years from now? If you come back in seven years from now and you keep seeing this every time you go outside to your garage, are you going to remember in seven or 10 years what's inside that jug? Chances are you won't. You will forget. And then heaven forbid anyone should try to use that like, oh, I think it's motor oil. Is it good motor oil? Is it bad motor oil? And then what? Somebody puts it inside your lawnmower, blows your engine. We don't know what's inside there anymore. And so there's a shelf life for chemicals. And if we have them, and this is weird, but if they're exposed to sunlight, if they're exposed to heat, if they're exposed to freezing temperatures, it can change the stability of the product, right? So do you have a stash like this in your house? And if you do, you might have hoarding tendencies because the reality is, are you ever going to open those paint cans and go back and paint your house again? Especially if it's an interior paint, you don't want whatever's out there that's been exposed now in the heat and the temperatures and the cold to then what, you're going to mix it up again and you're going to have dry, crusty stuff on the side of the inside of the paint can that's going to get mixed up in the paint. Now you're going to paint your walls with it and it's going to have little globs of stuff. I promise I know this story. I've seen it happen too many times. You're going to get some fresh paint if you're going to do a fresh paint job, right? You're not going to ever use any of that stuff again. So this stuff, this whole entire section of stuff that we're looking at right now, it cannot be saved and it cannot be thrown in the trash. This has to be taken to a landfill where they have specific groups and like the landfill that, that is near where I live, there are specific groups of people that are trained to take chemicals. Like these are combustible chemicals that can't just be poured in the ground. They have to be dealt with separately. And so there's a whole team of people that is trained for that. So when you go to the dump yard, they'll say, come to this station and drop this off here. Come over to this station and drop your stuff off here. And they have people that are trained to deal with this. This is going to require a very special section of the junkyard where you drop this stuff off. And I will share this with you. We've seen this a lot of times in our move in, move out cleans. You can't take this with you. There's not a moving company on the planet that will take, <clears throat> excuse me, that will take any of this stuff on a move. They're not going to put it on the back of the truck. They are not going to take it with them. So wherever you're going, you're not taking this with you. So if it's old, old gas, whether it's motor oil, whether it's paint, whether it's cleaning supplies, whether it's pesticides, they're not taking it with them. So just, just heads up so that you know. Um, so we have, uh, Angela just joined us. I would like to say, Angela, how are you doing today? Come on and say hi. I'll throw you up here on the screen. How are you today? Um, it's good to see you. Hi. So I'm we, doing fine. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm super excited that you're here. Thank um, you for doing all the videos. I've learned so much. Oh, thank you. This is really fun for me. This has been um, an interesting journey. When I first started out in this process, the, the learning period for me was learning that we're all going through some of this stuff together. So it was just a process of having these conversations over and over again to help us uncover some of the reasons why we have this stuff that we have. So uh, Jilly Bean here said some municipalities have a uh, free turn in chemical uh, kind of days. And that is awesome. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I know that for um, some areas, like I know that some um, recycling pickups, they won't pick that stuff up. And so if they have recycling days, sometimes they'll advertise that or that will be in the newspaper. And then they allow you to then either set it out on the curb or they will make a special trip by on certain days. So I love that. Thank you for bringing that up so much. Um, and uh, Joanne says, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Joanne is up here. So um, I have uh, uh, Rita with me. Rita is helping me here because I can't type as fast as I can. So she's she's helping me here in the comments as well. So thank you, Rita, for, for adding comments and, and making sure that we get people connected with our broadcast here. All right, the next image that I wanna share with you, and this is again, something that's near and dear to my heart, are pallets. And these pallets come when you order mulch or you order dirt or you order plants or things like that. They'll bring them on the great big Lowe's truck or the Home Depot truck and they drop them off in your driveway. And if you live in the city, this is not, it, it's not a great big dump truck where they just load a, a dump truck of stuff. They bring them on pallets. Then after you unload all the pallets, you're stuck with these pallet racks. And then what do you do with them? And so 
lots of people will save them, hoping that one day they're going to come by and pick them up. And again, some trash services do not pick them up. So even if you set them out on the curb, they won't pick them up. One thing I have found in order to get rid of them is that you can put a, an ad on Nextdoor and it's a free ad. You just say, hey, I have these pallets. If anybody wants to drop by and pick them up, I know there are a lot of art and craft people that will paint them and they make furniture out of them. And oftentimes the truck coming back through the way will drop by and they'll see this as well. And they'll say, oh, we'll take all those pallets back. So there are also pallet days where they'll come by and they'll, they'll take them back. And I know this happens like during the spring in my neighborhood all the neighbors will have like stacks and stacks of pallets where they've had mulch and dirt and stuff like that delivered before they're doing the reseeding and it's grass seed, it's mulch, it's peat moss, it's all that kind of stuff. And so then the, the Home Depot truck will swing back by. And a lot of people that have rented the trucks, I know you can rent the trucks for a day. A lot of people will drop back by and they will uh, take them all on their way and just like make one great big loop and scoop them all up and drop them off. So there are ways of doing that as well. But if you have these and they haven't been picked up, you might have some hoarding tendencies if you're just letting them kick around and there's no plan whatsoever. All right. It's important to just realize that you're not the only one. Okay. Other people are going through the exact same thing because they either haven't gotten around to calling somebody to pick them up. They haven't put an ad yet on the next door. They haven't let anybody know that they're stashed right behind the big stack of bushes that they have in their front yard. So it might be a sign. All right, the next one that we have to talk about are old appliances. Now, this last week, my washing machine broke. After 13 years, it just conked out. It just died. It wouldn't turn on. And we've had a funeral in the family. And my first thought was, I just can't deal with this right now. I just can't deal with my washing machine right now. And I just wanted to put it off. The challenge is this. While there's stuff going on in our lives, the interesting thing for me is, because I have hoarding tendencies, my first thought is I'll deal with it later. Okay, Not a priority. I'll deal with it later. I have to stop and say, wait a second, if I walk myself through the scenario, this is where it gets good. This is where we go back to the markers, right? If you have markers for hoarding tendencies, you now have choices. So in the back of my head, if I can't deal with it right now, and I found out that my washer broke when I went to do my laundry, what that means is I have laundry that needs to be done right now. If I put this off, while I don't have time to make a phone call right now and have a repairman come to my house and fix my washing machine, what this means is at some point, I'm going to end up with more dirty laundry and I'm going to have to take time out of my schedule and I'm going to have to go all the way down to the coin laundry and I'm going to have to wait while my laundry washes at the coin laundry. And then what? I'm going to do it again the next week and the next week and the next week because I didn't get it fixed. There's never going to be a better time than right now. So if I know this about myself and I know that I'm a procrastinator because it's not a priority right now and I don't have time to deal with it right now, that's exactly why I should deal with it right now. So I contacted my husband and I said, can you make a phone call and can you get somebody out here to fix the, the washing machine? And you know what he told me? <laughs> I don't have time right now. I'm not able to do it right now. Ah, do you know what that means? That means either I can put it off and find myself in a sad situation where I have clothes that have piled up. And again, I'm going to have to go to the coin laundry and I still have to get my washing machine fixed. Or I'm going to have to stop what I'm doing right now. I'm going to have to stop and make the phone call and get somebody out here. Oh no, that means I'm going to have to be here when the repair guy comes, right? It's okay. Let's just go ahead and deal with it right now. So I did. I got on the phone. He said, no problem. We can come out. He came out. He fixed the washing machine. He had to order a part. And then he was able to come out and get the washing machine fixed. Okay. So if you have old appliances that have not been dealt with, that have not been fixed, are you going to fix them or are you going to replace them? And when I talked to the re repair guy, he said, the machine that you have probably doesn't have a part for it. They probably don't even make that part anymore. I'm going to probably just recommend that you buy a new washing machine. And I asked my husband, do you want to just buy a new washing machine? And he said, actually, I don't. Because he said the washing machine and dryer match. And he said, I think it would drive me bonkers if I got a new washing machine and it looked different from the dryer that works perfectly fine. And so he's, he has some OCD tendencies. He says it would make me crazy if I gave away a dryer that works perfectly and I wouldn't want mismatched appliances. So if I can get the old one fixed, then at least they match. I was like, oh, okay, that's so weird, but all right, let's do that right? So there are reasons people hang on to stuff. And there's a reasons that they let it go. 
and their reasons they put it outside on their front porch and they hope that I don't know what it's going to get fixed or something's going to happen. So if you have old appliances, it might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. Again, it's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just a sign. So if you have broken appliances, whether it's a toaster, whether it's a waffle iron, whether it's an iron that you use to iron your clothing with, whether it is a larger appliance like a refrigerator or a stove or a washing machine or a dishwasher, if you have an extra appliance that hasn't been dealt with, this is a good time to stop and just deal with it and say, hey, what's going on here, right? It doesn't mean anything's right or wrong. It just means it might be a good time to have a conversation. Again, it's those markers that then let us have choices, right? All right, our next slide. I love this. This is so much fun. Um, and Melanie says, I was going to start a procrastination group on Facebook, but I never got around to it. <laughs> I love that. All right, this gets a happy bell from me. Here's my happy bell. Good job, Melanie. That was a good one. That was awesome. Ah, all right. I know that uh, during the pandemic, lots of us were focused on food and food storage. And one of the things that I want to draw attention to, if we take a look at this, this is a pantry of someone, not someone I know. This is a, a picture that we actually, this is just stock photography that we pulled off the internet because we didn't want to embarrass anyone we know. But I wanted to share this with you because if you look at the purple bag that's there on the shelf in the middle, and you go over to the left of that bag, what's behind that purple bag? And the answer is we don't know because we can't see. If you had to get what, what is ever behind that purple bag, how are you going to get it? Because there's stuff on the floor. Stuff is stored on the floor in the space where you would need to move stuff around if you were going to get that food storage that's behind the purple bag. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because most of us have some version of a pantry or we have a pantry shelf or we have some kind of food storage or something where when we buy groceries and we buy a couple extras, we put them in there. But how are you storing them? And if you're storing them so that they're all stacked on top of each other so that you can't get to them, that might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. If you're storing stuff on the floor so that you have to trip over it and it's causing a trip hazard when you try to go in there to get stuff, that might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. Now, I'm not knocking anybody's food storage plan and I'm not knocking the people that don't have a lot of space. But what I'm suggesting is that there might be a better way to do this so that you just haven't chuffed a bunch of stuff in there because here's what happens. And after 30 years in the cleaning business and going inside people's homes, one of the packages that we've always sold as an upsell package is that of, it's, called, it's a special package where we go inside their pantries and we pull everything out and we take a look at all the expiration dates. One of the things that we've discovered with almost all the homes that have pantries like this is there is a bunch of expired food. And a lot of the, the soft food, and I say soft food that's like easily accessible from mice and rodents, is that it, it gets weevils in it, especially like the flour or the wheat or the rice, things like that. It will get weevils in it. We will find um, boxes that are chewed apart. And this is things like cereal. It could be things like little fruit bars or bags of chips. And even though you would think, well, they're, they're already in covers, right? They're, they have boxes and packaging on them. If animals or rodents can climb through that and they can chew through that, they will. And then what happens is they contaminate the food. And even if you could get to it after you've uncovered it, one of the things we've discovered is it's not really sanitary once you get to it. And so my suggestion has always been there's a way to store food properly if you're going to have food storage, and that's in airtight, clear containers. And so one of the, the quick, easy, fast, dirty ways that we do this are clear plastic shoe boxes. You can buy them in bulk at large discount stores. You can buy them online, but just a clear plastic shoe box. It's got a clear lid. It's got clear sides on it. You can store a lot of like a whole bag of flour inside one of those with a, a lid on it. They stack on top of each other so that instead of having a whole bunch of stuff here, you can't see, you can turn it all sideways and you could have it all organized so that you can see it. And then no rodents or anything are going to get to that, right? And if you have to start moving them because they stack on top of each other, you can stack them either to the side and just have them go up the side of the wall instead of having a whole bunch of stuff just loose that's in the way that you're going to trip over. So if you've just chunked a whole bunch of stuff inside your pantry or inside a closet or inside a storage space or a scary room, it could be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. 
So again, it's just something that you may want to have a conversation about with you or a loved one. And why are you storing things the way that you are? Uh, Melanie says, when they delivered the washing machine, I paid for the removal of appliance and they took away a fridge that for some reason the motor had given up. And so they got rid, given up for the one thing I got rid of two appliances. That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, I know that when we had our freezer replaced and this was a service that came out, they dropped the freezer off and they took the old freezer away that had broken. Um, they did it. I mean, literally within minutes. And I was thinking, oh no, it's going to be this big ordeal. They were in our property, unpacked the new freezer, took the old one away and they were gone within minutes. I mean, they were at my house all of like six or seven minutes. They plugged everything in, tested everything, took a bunch of pictures to make sure that the lights were on and it was working and boom, it was gone. And I was like, whoa, that was the easiest, most simple thing that I've ever done, right? So there are a lot of services and I'm glad you brought that up, Melanie, thank you. That when they bring a new appliance, they do haul the other appliances away. So that's awesome. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, the next thing that I wanna share with you is not just about food, but this is about stuff that we store inside our homes. We call this oftentimes a scary room. And the scary room is when you have stuff that you've just chunked into a room to hurry and close the door because relatives or people are coming over. And in this picture, if you look back to the very back of the table, there's a glass table. And on the glass table is sitting a great big display of, I'm going to say, china or little tea dishes. Anybody that comes in that room that bumps that tray, all of those are going to go crashing to the floor, right? That is not how we store stuff, even in a scary room. And if you look up close to the front of the picture, you'll see some Christmas chargers. And on the Christmas chargers, we have a couple of dishes that look like they could go cascading to the floor and possibly just break. And right in front of that is a dumped over candle stand or a candle mode votive. All right, so stuff has already been a little bit topsy-turvy, okay? So some people have just chunked this in there in hopes that I don't know what. It's not going to organize itself. It's not going to be easy to find. If you're looking for something in any of these boxes, all of that stuff has to be moved and shifted around anyway, right? And the reason that I bring that up is because if you're going to end up shifting stuff and moving it around to get to whatever's underneath it, you might as well pack it up correctly to begin with so that it can be stored properly if you value that stuff. So if you're hanging on to stuff and just chunking it into a room, you might have some hoarding tendencies. And this is also true for people that have storage units where they've just chunked stuff inside the storage unit and there's no rhyme or reason because when you go to get it out, if you ever do, you have to move everything around anyway. And in the process, you find stuff that has either expired or stuff that you don't need anymore that you don't want. You're just storing it and paying to store it. Or in the process of moving it, it gets chunked and then junked. And then it, you, either you just store it for no good reason or it breaks in the process. So if you're going to store stuff and it's fine if you do, make sure that it's packed up properly so that it's just not willy-nilly for grandkids to run through the room and knock all that stuff off because then why did you save it in the first place? And if you didn't have time to pack it up right, you're not going to have time to stop and clean up all the broken pieces and all that stuff. So again... It's just another idea and something to have a conversation about. All right, our next idea. This one is about luggage. And many people have luggage like this or their parents did or their grandparents did or whatever. And there was a time that became really popular when this kind of luggage became not, not cool anymore. The luggage that had the little wheels on them where you spin the luggage and it, it's turn skinny so you can like walk it down the aisle of an airplane. That became the popular stuff. These types of luggages became really unpopular because they're hard to store. They don't stack. They just take up space inside your closet. They don't travel well. They're super heavy to carry. They're not um, ergonomic in any way. It's not like you can pack another suitcase on the great big long handle and then wheel it along with you. It's just, it, it's clunky and old, right? Nothing wrong with it. It's just that technology and modernization has made our luggage so much better. So the question needs to be for every household, how much luggage do you need? In my house, we decided two pieces per person. We have a big suitcase and a little suitcase. And so in the event that we go on a trip, and my husband and I have traveled all over the world, and as we've traveled all over the world, we take one carry-on suitcase and a backpack. That's it. Everything that we carry has to fit inside those two bags. And in my backpack, I've got my laptops. I carry two laptops and I carry all my camera equipment inside my laptops. 
And so that's what I take with me, like save it, save it for dear life. And then all my clothes and all the other stuff goes inside my carry on, right? That's, that's it for traveling around the entire world. So how many pieces of suitcase do you need? And the reason that I ask is because a lot of people whose homes that we've been in have lots and lots of extra suitcases. It was their dad's suitcase. It was their grandpa's. It was their brothers. It was their cousins. It was whatever. And it got hand, hand me down. And then as people have old luggage and the handle breaks, they will get a new piece of luggage and they don't get rid of the old, right? Are you one of those people you got a new piece of luggage, but you saved the old? Why did you do that? That might be a sign of a hoarding tendency, right? Where you have stuff that was once good. Maybe it's even still good. In this picture, the luggage is still good, right? But new luggage has been purchased. Why are you hanging on to the old stuff? Great question. All right. Along with uh, suitcases, we have to talk about towels. And the reason we talk about towels is because this is one of those things that often gets replaced. And as people buy new sets of towels and linens and stuff like that, they'll hang on to the old. And it's a peculiar thing that you would buy new linens, new bed sheets, new bedding, new towels, and you upgrade your house, you upgrade the, the room that you're decorating, and yet you hang on to the old stuff. Why are you hanging on to it? I know why, because you're saying, well, I could use it for the pets. I could use it to wrap something in if we're moving, right? I can use it as a cushioning. I could use that in case it's the winter time and I want to put the towel over the front windshield of my car so that I don't have to uh, scrape the windows in the morning, right? There are hundreds of reasons why we need old towels. The question is, how many do you need? So if you have linen closets full of old towels and you only ever use three or four extra old towels, how many do you need? Now, as someone with hoarding tendencies, I'll share with you that I too had a linen closet full of old towels. And I had this exact conversation with myself. And I hate admitting this, but as I'm helping other people go through their stuff, these conversations are going through my own head. And I'm like, uh, I think I have maybe too many towels of my own. And how often do I use them? And I could probably use three, four, five. Let's let's let the rest of them go. And one day, and they're perfectly good towels, but we've replaced them with new ones that match. So I, I went through my towel collection and I got rid of all the towels and all the washcloths that I wasn't using anymore because I didn't, I just didn't need them. So how many do you need? If you have an excess of mount, this might be the time to have a conversation because you might have hoarding tendencies, right? If it's not you, it might be a family member. Again, this just is to spark some conversations because these are the marker checks. These are just the, the things that say, hey, wait a second. Do I have that? This one is uh, not actually an item that most people buy. This comes in our Amazon packaging. And this more or less is just package packaging protection, bubble wrap and paper and stuff like that that we would use in packaging? Should we ever, I don't know, package something up and ship it? So my question to you is this, how often do you actually ship stuff? Now I used to, if I was gonna send one of my siblings something, I'd pack it up in a box and I'd ship them something. And then I discovered, well, how often do I actually ship stuff? And the answer is not very often. I really don't do it very often. And if I have a chance and I want to buy them something, I usually have it drop shipped to them where it never comes to me at all. I never see it. I never pack it up. I never need the packing supplies, right? So are you saving packing supplies for what? For what? So when you move, you'll have it so that you can pack something up and ship it one day. I woke up one day and I realized I had a bunch of boxes that I'd flattened. And we do use the boxes that are flattened. I've used them for years in move out cleans. Whenever we go to a customer's house, I always take boxes, stacks of boxes. I just fill up the back of my car because when I get to the house, nine times out of 10, make that 10 times out of 10. There's usually extra stuff that's strewn around the house and I box it all up, put packing tape on it and send it back to the person that should have cleaned it up before we tried to do the move out clean, right? It happens a lot. But I had all this packing supplies and bubble wrap and stuff like that. Why am I saving this? And so I, I literally just did a haul out and I got rid of all the shipping stuff. 
So if you're saving the shipping stuff, what for? Do you have a shipping business? Do you have an Etsy store? Is there a reason you're hanging on to it? And if not you, there's probably somebody in your neighborhood that does. You can put an ad on next door and say, I've got a bunch of packing stuff. If you want it, come get it. And somebody that could actually use it that's paying for that will come pick it up from you at no charge. Boom, out of your life, right? But if you're hanging on to it and you don't know why and you're not emotionally attached to it and you don't have a reason for it, that could be a marker, right? All right. The next one. I love this. This is so much fun, you guys. Um, purses, purses and handbags. How many times have you bought a new purse? You got rid of the old purse. Oh, wait, you didn't get rid of it. You just put it back in your closet. What? You just put it back in your closet? I know I've done this myself. I'm like, well, there's still some good in it. Why did you replace it then? If it was still good and it was still a nice purse, why did you replace it? And if I replaced it because there was a newer model, it was more fashionable or whatever, that's a good chance to get rid of the old one. So if you have two or three handbags, that's okay. But if you have four or five, 10, 20, 30, 40 handbags, are you ever going to use them again? Really? Are you going to empty all that stuff out, put it in another bag just so that you can have a different color? Most people don't. And then if you're like me, you wake up one day and you find that you got like five to 10 extra handbags that are old and they're kind of worn out. They kind of have some life left in them. You might have hoarding tendencies. I don't mean to just tell on myself, but that's a good donation thing. That's a good thing to just drop inside a donation box and get rid of it. If you're never going to use that handbag or that purse again, get rid of it, right? It might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies if... You're hanging on to stuff like this that you've already replaced. You've already replaced it. You've already said goodbye to it once, right? You already replaced it. Why are you hanging on to it? And if you're hanging on to it and you don't know why, you might have hoarding tendencies. Okay, next one. This is a stack of laptop computers. And the laptop computers all worked at one time. However, this is old technology and now none of them actually work anymore. And so while there's space for these, I see that it's there's nothing crowded around these. There's perfect space here. But the question is, what, what is happening with these? And is it that somebody didn't get rid of these because there is private information on there and they didn't want it to fall into the wrong hands? Is it because they're hoping one day what well, they're going to get them fixed? What is the purpose of hanging on to old electronics? And I myself... I've had this question lots of times because as technology changes, I'm guilty like most people. I want the latest, greatest, bestest of everything, right? But if you're one of those people that keeps upgrading, what are you doing with the old stuff? If you've already replaced something, but you're hanging on to the old stuff, can you put it back into use? Can you use it for something else? If you have to hook two or three computers together, can you use one of them as a monitor? If they're just sitting there and they're just stacked there and they're not being used for anything, but yet you're hanging on to them, that might be a conversation that's worth digging into. And the reason I bring this up is because there are a lot of a lot of kids now, and I say kids, they're, they're younger than me, they're youthful, who are big into electronics and they're big into gaming and they're buying lots of things for these home gaming centers that they're building. And as they figure out that a piece of equipment doesn't work for them, some of it's still good, like it's new out of the box. They tried to hook it up like a little cam link or something and it was the wrong one. Instead of sending it back, they hang on to it and it's perfectly good. Can you sell that stuff? Can you repurpose it? Can you use it for something else? And if not, by the time that they finally make a decision to do something with it, it's now can't be sent back. It's past the return date, or maybe there's a newer version or newer technology. I remember a time, and this is years ago, after we got married, my husband was like all into wanting to get a PlayStation. And I thought that was really cool, but he doesn't play games anyway. I've never known him to play any games. And so he wanted this PlayStation. I was like, okay, maybe he's going to play games on his day off or something. So he bought this PlayStation and it wasn't cheap. I mean, it was a couple hundred dollars. It was, it was not cheap. And he got a game to go with it. I'm like, okay, cool. I got this game and the console. And, you know, now I'm going to sit here and I'm going to play this game or whatever. I don't know if he ever even took it out of the box. I never, to this day, I never saw him play it. And then several generations of the PlayStation later, he's like, hey, I should get another PlayStation. And I said, wait just a second. Wait just a second, mister. You had a PlayStation and you never used it. You never took it out of the box. I don't think you ever played the one game that you had. Why are you going to get a new version of the thing you never used? 
right? So a lot of people are upgrading, 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 because that's the thing that we do. We keep up with the Joneses. But if you're not using this stuff, please don't keep buying it. And before anything, and what happened is we actually gave the PlayStation that we bought that was still new in the box. We gave it to a kid that was trying to learn gaming or something like that. And he was able to use it and he was able to make use of it. But it was way, way, way beyond the return date. And it was nothing we could, it was just a waste of money for us. But by having those conversations, we were able to stop and go, ah, you're right. I never did use it. I probably will not use it again. Should I buy a newer version? And so if you're buying stuff just to be buying it, eh, it might be a marker that you have hoarding tendencies. All right. Uh, there's a question here, and this is a great question. And the question says, if you had to pay full price for it, would you buy it again? And that's a great question to have because the answer is sometimes the answer is no, we wouldn't buy it again. In this particular case, I don't know, maybe. Maybe they buy the computers again, but what are these all still doing here? And how come nobody's using them? All right, this is not electronics as far as a hard electronic item, but this is, and I love this, this is messaging that either has been responded to or it has not. Now, the reason that I have this in here is because if you collect messages and you never empty your in bin, that might be a symptom that you have hoarding tendencies. Your comfort zone is to have far more than you need, even if you've processed them. Do you remember how we processed the stuff from the box? We took the stuff out of the box, but saved the wrapping. We've already used the stuff or we've already replaced the purse, but we hung on to the old. You've already answered the email and yet you hang on to the messages and they just fill up your in bin. I was talking to somebody the other day and they had over 100,000 emails in their email bin. <laughs> I said, what are you doing with all these emails? It's electronic hoarding, right? We don't think of hoarding in terms of electronic hoarding online, right? But what was interesting about the conversation was he said, if I ever have to reference any of those emails, I can go back through and I can find those emails to make sure that we have the conversation and I don't miss any details. So my question to him was, how long has it been or how often do you go back and actually go through all your emails? And you know what he told me? He said, never, it never happens. And I said, so there you have over 100,000 emails and for what? Where would you even start if you needed to reference them? He said, I don't know. Okay, then that's a time we want to start having conversations, right? If you have messages and phone calls and emails and all this stuff that just keeps piling up, is that your comfort zone? And if it is, just why? No judgments, just why? Why is that this way, right? Is there something that makes you more comfortable about just hanging on to something for dear life like this gentleman so that you don't miss the message. Because what's happening is you're missing a whole bunch of stuff because you, you can't sort through what you need and get to it in a timely manner. Another version of this is, um, whoops, wrong screen. It's when we take pictures and I'll make this big so you can see it, but we take pictures and this is the same picture a whole bunch of times. Have you ever done this? You take like five or 10 pictures trying to get the perfect one. And then you have five or 10 versions of almost the exact same picture. And yet you never take them off your phone. So if you're scrolling through your phone here, what you see is <laughs> the same picture, like scroll, 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 scroll. And it's the same picture over and over and over and over and over again. Right. Why don't you get rid of them? Why don't you just keep the good one? Many people will hang on to hundreds and thousands of photos just because they're afraid to get rid of one that's almost as good. Right. But if people have like closed eyes or they're blinking or they don't have quite the smile that you're looking for or whatever, get rid of those. Get rid of those. Just clear out the electronic clutter, right? If you're saving all the pictures, all the variations of them, it might be a marker that you have hoarding tendencies. All right. Very interesting concept. Here's one about clothing. You buy certain styles of clothing or certain pieces of clothing, but you buy one in every color. Why? Why? Why not buy different items with different colors so that you have a variety instead of buying the same item in all the colors, right? There's a store near where I used to live and it was called the Rugged Warehouse. I don't know if you guys have that where you live. I think it's now called Gabe's, but uh, the Rugged Warehouse was one of these stores. Oh, I'm so guilty of this. I'd go inside and I remember one uh, winter time and in North Carolina, we don't have heavy winters, but um, they had this really 
nice display of athletic wear. And just like these shirts that you see here in the picture, they had, it was all this, uh, what do you call it? Performance fabric that was like stretchy fabric and it wicked away sweat and it was wrinkle resistant and color fast. It was like workout stuff, long sleeves. And I tried one of the shirts on, I've got really long arms and they fit me perfectly. So I bought one in every color. And then for the next 13 years, I wore these shirts over and over and over and over whenever I wasn't wearing my blue shirt. <laughs> I wore these athletic performance shirts and finally, and I, I still wear them to this day. Like I'll wear them to bed. I wear them outside. I wear them underneath my, my blue shirt. If it's in the winter time, I, I still wear them to this day. So I'll have them and then I've taken great care of them. My husband says, you know, are those things ever going to wear out? And I said, no, they're going to last me forever. Right. But do you, do you have a tendency to buy one in every color? And this, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm one of those people. I, I, it was this only this one particular item, but if you're buying lots of items like that, it might be a marker that you have hoarding tendencies, okay? Something to have a conversation about. All right, the next one is shoes. Do you have hundreds and thousands of different kinds of shoes? Maybe not hundreds and thousands, but one of the, the things that we take a look at here are lots of shoes because most people have, on average, 40 pair of shoes. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I don't have 40 pair of shoes. I only have like six pair, right? Only six pair. Yet when we start pulling shoes out of people's homes, and I've been doing this for over 30 years, the average person has over 40 pair of shoes in their house right now. And there's a pair here. There's a pair there. There's a pair in the garage. There's a pair out on the back porch. There's a pair in the coat closet, <laughs> a couple pair in the bathroom. There's a pair in the bedroom. There's a couple pair in the closet. People don't realize how many shoes they have until they pull them all in one space. And then as you bring all the shoes into one space, people are like, oh, I forgot about all those shoes. I didn't realize I had all those shoes. And it just, it's, it just is a self-perpetuating cycle because they don't see them all in one spot. Therefore, when they go to the store and they see shoes on sale, they're like, oh, got to get me a new pair of shoes. And so people will buy shoes and not replace them. They're replacing new ones, but not getting rid of the old ones, right? So they're just bringing more in and not, it's like the purse. They're not letting go of the old. And so this might be, if this is your shoe collection, this might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. All right, we are at the very tail end here of our conversation. There are a couple more things that I could go over really fast. Papers is one of them. Um, I'll make these big so you can see, but I wanna answer your questions as well. If you have any questions that you wanna throw at me here at the last few minutes of our time together. Um, one of the things we have to look at is uh, stuffed animals. These stuffed animals could be your children's. It could be your grandchildren's. It could be yours from when you were young and now you're older, but you still have them. Why do you have so many? It could be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. If you've saved all the toys from forever, it might be, it might be a sign. If you have books, lots and lots of books, if they're all neatly contained on a bookshelf and you have a bookshelf, that's forgivable, that's that's okay, that's understandable. But if you have books scattered in every room of the house, that might be a sign that you have hoarding tendencies. There's nothing wrong with having books and I'm an avid book person myself. I absolutely love books. But if they're scattered in every room of the house and you have them on top of your dressers and on top of the bureaus and inside the closets and on the floor and by the side of the sofa, and if you have them strewn all about the house, that might be a sign that you have an issue with books. One of the things that we have to be careful with books is that they um, mice will chew on them if they get inside your house. And there was a, a gentleman whose house we cleaned and he had, I'm not kidding, he had a whole shed in his backyard of magazines. And when I asked him, what are your plans for the magazines? He said, my plan is that I'm going to rip all the pages out and I'm going to use them for mulch in my garden. And I said, that is such an awesome idea. The problem is he also lived in the city and his garden was like a little planter box where you could use probably less than half of one magazine. And here he had thousands in his, his little shed. And so what is the proper number that you need to keep? right? Is it magazines? Is it books? Are you using Kindle books? Are you in a position that you might transfer over to something electronic? I know there was a moment in my life where I realized that most of the reading I was doing was not books. And I love books, but it was um, conversations that I was having online. I was interacting with people online. I was studying online. I was watching YouTube videos online. I wasn't reading the books like I used to read. And all the books that I was reading could be replaced now on a smartphone in my hand. And so why not carry all the books with me on my hand and get rid of all the hard books that I'm saving? So again, 
just something to think about, something to have a conversation with. And are you storing to go containers that you never have anywhere to go to? Like if you are repacking these with new food for lunch that you're going to take to work, that's one thing. But if you're not going to work and you're working from home and you don't have anywhere to take the to go containers, are you saving them? Are you saving them and for what? So I want to stop here for just a minute. This is going to be the end of our, our slide show for today. I just want to drive to your attention the fact that sometimes we have things in our lives and we don't really know why. We haven't paid a lot of attention to why they're in our lives or what the purpose is for us. And a lot of times, and this is the weird part of it, a lot of times there's no purpose. We have no emotional attachment to the stuff. We don't care about it at all. If it were to go, that's fine. If we were to keep it, that's fine. Yeah, it's just in our life and it's taking up space. So that's the purpose of this conversation. It's just like, hey, do you have these markers? And if you do, here's what could happen. But now is a good time to have a conversation about it. Um, does anyone have any questions that you want to ask me before we jump out of here? I just want to make sure that uh, if you guys are um, asking questions here, that I get them answered. Nancy says, former gardening editor here, glossy magazine paper does not make good mulch. Oh, that breaks my heart because he saved so many magazines. Corrugated cardboard, black and white newsprint would be better. Um, thank you for that tip. I'm going to give you a happy bell for that. That's awesome. And for everybody that's on this call, please don't save glossy magazines because Nancy says that is not good and will not help us. Uh, Patty G says, thank you so much. Uh, Angela, it's uncomfortable to hear, but it's necessary. It is uncomfortable to hear, and I'm glad that you brought that up. I want to um, bring to our attention the fact that having these conversations will never be easier than right now. It's going to be really tough after we leave, if our family members have to go through our stuff and we're, we've been hoarding or hanging on to stuff that we didn't need, didn't want, we weren't emotionally attached to it. And they think, oh, this must have been really important to my mom because she held on to it for 30 years. And so then they hold on to it for 30 years trying to be honorable and do the right thing. And lo and behold, it never meant anything to the mother in the first place. She just didn't get rid of it and didn't know why right? So the easiest conversations we're ever going to have about this stuff is us right now. And like the buck stops here right now, I'm not going to move forward in my life and have a whole bunch of stuff that I don't need because I don't want my family to be burdened with it. And if it doesn't mean anything to me now, I'm going to give myself permission to end that behavior right now. If I have hoarding tendencies right now, I want to know why, what was the trigger? If the trigger for me was like, oh, hey, I don't have a garden anymore and I don't need all the potted plant empty bins. Let me get rid of that right now to somebody that can use them and I'm not going to buy any more. And if I save some, it might be one or two, but it's not going to be, you know, hundreds of them. The buck stops here. This is where the conversation stops because I do have choices. I'm now aware and I now have choices. Yay. All right, you guys, this was so much fun. Thanks so much for joining me. Again, we're going to be here this time, same same time, same place next week. I do appreciate you joining me. And we will be answering your questions in the Facebook group. If you're not a member, it is a Facebook group, Hoarding World. And you don't have to be a hoarder to participate. It's just where we're having conversations. We're doing before and after pictures. And we're carrying on this discussion as we're all working through our relationship with stuff. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much. And I will see you guys same place next time.